Kim Stevens, an engineer and planner, is the executive director of the Partnership for Water Sustainability in BC. Kim has more than four decades of experience, including significant water resource planning, modeling, engineering, and implementation. He has played a leadership role in a series of initiatives in British Columbia related to water conservation and sustainability, watershed health, rainwater management, and green infrastructure. In the late 1990s, he was a member of the Ministry of Environment Working Group that developed a water conservation strategy for British Columbia. He looked at rainfall differently, and in the early 2000s, developed the water balance methodology that the provincial government incorporated into stormwater planning, a guidebook for British Columbia. And he also developed the Water Sustainability Action Plan for British Columbia. More recently, he was the principal author and editor of Beyond the Guidebook 2015, moving towards sustainable watershed systems through asset management. He has received wide recognition for his pioneering efforts. This includes a Premier's Award for Excellence in Innovation in 2009 and invitations to make keynote presentations at water and environmental forums throughout North America and in Australia. Please join me in welcoming him to our workshop. And thank you. And, uh, you know, it's great that the sun is up, but of course, you know, about half an hour ago we went and setting this up, you can see the slides. <laughs> So we will have to, uh, what do you say, when paint the picture verbally, right? Right. Right. So what, what you might be able to see here is that the uh, you know, headline is what happens on the land does matter. And again, we're here because of water. I'm a career water guy. But what you know, historically we have done, we have siloed, we have siloed uh, water and land. But you know, people that need to remember and understand and actually change their ethic because your land ethic actually influences what happens to water. So the land ethic has consequences for water. Um, tagline under there is, is moving towards sustainable watershed systems through asset management. And I was quite pleased this week, of course, because part of the announcements from the, uh, from the feds and the province is that sustainable watershed systems through asset management, we have received funding to keep moving the initiative along provisionally, so uh, it does help to get the money. It's too bad I can't see this picture. <laughs> because uh, what I'm going to do here is to provide my career perspectives on um, contrasting approaches to managing risk. And in terms of my, the earlier part of my career, a big part of my career really is, is grounded here in the District of North Vancouver because in, in Halloween 1981, everything went crazy in North Vancouver. Um, Skeeter Creek uh, jumped the banks of Bob Monroe, but you grew the Monroe Fire Station. Uh, number 310 New Deal Court, though there was a culvert under the house which nobody knew about, like the people lived there, that flux, it just cascaded down the hillside and impacting you know, all the uh, uh, residents who lived below on the, the Mission Creek system. Over on, uh, on, 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 uh, on Kilmer, the, the Kilmer diversion flood uh, in several locations, it cascaded down the hill. And of course, uh, Mill Creek, uh, by the old landfill, um, the erosion of the banks along there exposed a lot of garbage. So that was in 1981. And the photograph that I have on my left side, it says dealing with consequences, um, being reactive in solving problems, and on the right hand side it says, or eliminate the causes. I wish you could see this because this was in part, this is this location, Parkside Creek in 1987. And if you think back to about 1987, that was only a matter of, of a few years after all that development started on the Seymour bench lines there. And so this was an example of the houses, you can kind of see the picture, didn't really know that there was a creek flowing between their properties because before there was development, it was just like a depression in the ground and it was so overgrown with, with blackbirds and animals and all kinds of stuff. Nobody knew the water flowing there until 1987. And so uh, my task was to retrofit a floodway <laughs> the snake between those houses. And but that's that's what we did in the 80s because you know our, our we weren't looking beyond the creek channel. As opposed to this this image over here it says it's a picture of a creek by my house today and it says mimic flow duration. So that's the key word mimic flow duration. Replicate the pathways by which rainwater or rainfall reaches stream. So that's kind of the big picture messaging. 
I hope you can see this. Can you go to the back there? Where you can see it? Because really, um, the purpose of giving you that example was to then uh, point you to the need for action right now because redevelopment of single family uh, neighborhoods, that actually creates the opportunity to get it right the second time. That's part of our key message for this entire bioregion. When I say bioregion, I'm talking about the east coast of the island, um, Metro Bay, Fraser Valley, because you know, because we're hemmed in by the mountains, sea, the U.S. border, and the agricultural land, it means our growth, our redevelopment, is redevelopment of watersheds. So we are getting a chance, if we do it right, to fix things up. What this graph shows you in terms of, it's a how, it's showing you when housing stock was, was built. In our short, this happens to be for Hoskins Creek neighborhood. Uh, within the, the Hastings Street system. And what that shows you is, you know, the number of houses by decades, so here's the 1950s, the 1960s. So you see peaking in the 1970s, and of course over here you see the, the redevelopment, you know, the little houses on big lots being replaced by the big houses on small lots. So what that shows you right now is that in terms of, this is the graphic produced by, by district staff. Here, here we are, you know, 2015-ish, uh, right about now, uh, this area where, in terms of as the housing stock turns over, there's a window of opportunity. You get one window every 50 years. So, <laughs> will the district act in time, mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor? <laughs> to catch the peak because time is of the essence. Kind of linking what I'm saying back to the, uh, the title of this workshop. So what can stream keepers do? Well, the scope of involvement and influence is expanding beyond the creek channel. And there's something taking place in British Columbia right now. It's kind of a rekindling of something that took place back in the 90s or 2000s in terms of the stewardship sector. On Tuesday, Wednesday, I was in the Comox Valley for a, a similar, uh, what was called the Comox Valley's Eco Asset Symposium. And that was an event organized by the stewardship sector, sponsored by local government. And it just exceeded anybody's expectations up there. And, and for me, one of the delighting moments was on the, uh, the data symposium, they're about to introduce me for my second segment in the afternoon, and, and the moderator asked for a show of hands from this audience where it was 160 people. They turned people away, they expected 50 or 60. How many people were from outside the Tomox Valley? I see the hands without. What that shows you is across this province, you know, there's this movement taking place within the stewardship sector. And it's, the key is how the stewardship sector partners with local government. So what I, what I have here is a quote from one of my colleagues, Peter Law, who is not, not only formerly with the Ministry of Environment, but he's also a vice president of the mid Bank Royal Habitat Enhancement Society. And he says, looking ahead, an informed stewardship sector may prove to be the difference maker that accelerates implementation of the whole system water balance approach. And then he says, wouldn't it be great if everyone really understood what it means to think and act like a watershed? Because it's really hard. If you go outside, you don't feel like you're in a watershed. Like it's, it's all the, you know, we're all connected to the watershed. So in terms of convening for action, and when I use the expression convening for action, when my colleagues use the expression convening for action, we're saying, what will you do differently when you leave this room based on what you just learned? And I'm going to share three big ideas. These three big ideas provide a backdrop from the journey ahead of British Columbia because we are on a journey. This journey has been on the way for the last 20 years in terms of what I do. And so the three things, the three big ideas I'm introducing you to are shifting baseline syndrome, the whole system water balance approach, and then cathedral thinking. So that's what I want you to remember today. This image is what we call the BC process for moving from awareness to action, and it's found on alignment, collaboration, and partnerships. In British Columbia, we tend to use these words a lot to describe what we're doing. We don't really appreciate that people outside British Columbia don't know what we mean when we say collaboration, because we're different. In so many ways, the way we do business in British Columbia, especially the world of local government, is different from other places. But what is, the, what is the BC process? Well, it's the what, so what, now what, then what, uh, mind map. So what is the issue? Well, it's the form of land development impacts how water is used, how water runs off the land, that's a 
concerned this group, and how water reaches streams. So what can be done? Let's pause and give you the, give you the context of, as, a, as, a, as a water professional. Like my career has been defined by floods and droughts. And we talk about the hydrogeological hydro cycle because historically what happens, you have a flood a decade, you write a report, it goes on the shelf, similarly you have a you know, drug of a, a decade, you write a report, next decade you have a flood of drug, you have a report. That's been our historical pattern. So what can, how can we get from what is the issue to so what can be done? Well, what we're trying to do then is influence practitioners in the local government setting to design with nature. Design with nature. Now what can we do? Well, if everybody embraces shared responsibility and learns by doing, and most importantly establish precedence, and that's again a big part of the British Columbia approach, because local governments everywhere are individually establishing precedent. So not everybody can establish the same precedent, but if everybody establishes different precedents, then local governments can share and learn from each other. Once we've established the precedence for doing things better, well then, then what? Well, replicate in other communities. So as we look back, as I look back on my own career, what's the legacy of our past community planning infrastructure practice, servicing practice? Well, you're seeing it nowadays in terms of this new normal of floods and droughts, the normal water balance of watersheds, it's out of balance. It's that simple. Things are out of balance. You know, on an annual basis, we're getting about the same volume of water, but it's coming in a different way, it's coming in the form of extremes. And that's an upsetting system. The consequences, financial, level of service, life cycle impacts and implications, and those are what are drivers for local government action, including the District of North Vancouver, and a lot of good work has been done here. You really can't see this, can you? A little bit. A little bit. It's a satellite for it's a satellite photograph. What it's showing up there is British Columbia. What it's showing is the Pineapple Express. Kind of vague maybe you'll see the Pineapple Express, which, which the Pineapple Express is an atmospheric river. And that's kind of a new term that's just coming into language. And then I think all you need to understand right now is that for every one degree of uh, global warming uh, increase, a 1% temperature increase means that the atmosphere can carry an extra 7% of vapor. Hence, the kind of wild and crazy times we're having in the last few years of Pineapple Express. So what that's telling you is, I'm on a provincial working group right now, which is in the process of contributing to the, to the Green Communities Committee for the updating process to call the 2017 Refreshing Actions that's so why a couple of weeks ago I said to this group, you know, if we're being hammered, you know, in terms of the, of, of the, of the uh, thinking, think global, act local, if you're being hammered by an increasingly impactful Pineapple Express, you know, putting all your time and effort into energy efficient buildings isn't really going to cut it in British Columbia. Obviously, you've got to be doing this at the South of the long term, but, you know, the, the message being, you've got to put your efforts where it matters the most. So um, the significance of showing that, of course, was then I've got this <laughs> North Vancouver picture, which is really showing the cause and effect, right? The, uh, the Pineapple Express, and before you saw some rotating photographs that Glenn had up there showing them, the impact um, on the flood site. So, you know, there's really been stuff happening, and it has taken more than a decade to implement a policy program and develop regulatory for policy framework that actually makes possible water as a new community. And it goes back to Living Water Smart in 2008, but really what, in 2014, there were three game changes that came into effect. Game change, game change number one was the Water Sustainability Act was passed. And obviously, you two uh, voted in favor. <laughs> and, and one that doesn't get a lot of, a lot of profile these days is developed with CARE 2014. It should be a particular relevance to this group in terms of a lot of the environmental protection practices. But the linchpin, the linchpin to, to creating change right now is asset management for sustainable service delivery, a framework for BC. And the reason that's the linchpin is it ties directly to the provincial, federal provincial grant programs. If you haven't got, 
have begun to develop a strategy for asset management, you will get the money. And so what, what, the, what the BC framework is, 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 is doing it is providing a reason to look at infrastructure differently. And so that's what's setting the stage to integrate watershed systems thinking into asset management, which is what local government does. Again, introducing you to asset management for sustainable service delivery, and I see you can in the back. Okay. <laughs> um, shifting baseline syndrome. I think you can probably all relate to this because in 1995, Daniel Pauly coined the term shifting baseline syndrome. Daniel Pauly is a global fishery scientist. He's at UBC. He's actually from France originally. And all it was was a, you know, he said a think piece uh, to explain why do we allow things to incrementally deteriorate. And it doesn't matter what it is, right? It could be anything, but he was focusing on, 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 on fisheries. And his key point there was with each new generation, the expectations well, they actually get lowered in some of these because they said, when you come into the world where you come into a place, all you know is what you see now. Mm -hmm. So what, you're, what, what you're, you think that's the way it's always been, but what you're then measuring is what you see change after that. And so uh, he said, one of his quotes is, we transform the world that we don't know about right before us. And so while that, you know, and the, and the only reason I had targeted the use of this image is because three years ago, uh, three of us were, uh, went across the country doing a national workshop series, and we needed a way to kind of explain to people across the country why we thought differently. And this seemed to be a good way to do it. But then I began to realize, well, actually, what's happening in British Columbia, and it just happened to be 2014, was coincidental with uh, major sightings of dolphins and orca whales in House Town, and the salmon came back to Canada River, so there was a lot of good news, which tended to indicate maybe we were doing something right at the ground level in British Columbia. And so, you know, that may be what's happening over time everywhere, but we can also turn it around. But we can only turn it around, communities can only turn it around, in terms of recycling the baseline, if they implement standards and practice that restore a desired watershed condition. And those standards and practice have to be the right standards of practice. And right now we're still in that transition period where we haven't quite got rid of the practices, the standards of practice that actually got us into trouble over the last 30, 40, 50 years. So it's a long-term commitment. It takes time, commitment, and perseverance. But if you can just remember the shifting baseline syndrome to explain why do we allow things to imperceptibly decline, but we can turn it around. So in looking at development differently, and you know, here, here's a sound bite for you to think about. It's kind of turning the thinking around. So to protect watershed health, engineered infrastructure ought to fit into natural systems rather than the other way around. Think about it, right? Because right now, what we've been saying to do is, if you can see that it's a image of a rain garden on a North Vancouver Street, you know, there's a tendency to think that if we just retrofit a few rain gardens, maybe that's all we need to do. No, no, we have to change our mindset. Remember, I'm an engineer saying this. And so in terms of the Water Sustainability Action Plan, which is my responsibility, uh, which we've been implementing since 2003, uh, through partnerships from the bottom up, um, with top-down support from the province, well, uh, where we're heading is with advancing sustainable watershed systems through asset management. We talk about the twin pillars, Pillar number one, which is the water balance methodology, which you heard in the introduction, which is 2002 adopted by the province. And yet we're still, 15 years later, still changing uh, practices. And where we're heading now in developing the second pillar is what's called ecological accounting protocol as a tool to calculate the opportunity cost of drainage infrastructure, which is the responsibility of local government. So making different choices. So that speaks to the introduction of the new paradigm. It's really quite simple when you think about it. We weren't sure how this would play out. Watersheds as infrastructure assets. So since we're linking everything back to you know, money, because that's, you know, we've got, we're in the era where the word citizen has been replaced by taxpayer. Okay. You think about the implications of that. And, and, and the, uh, 
And so what, Mr. Mirror, what gets people's attention is money, right? <laughs> so that's the start point. But what we're talking about is a watershed is an integrated system. I mean, we don't think integrated. And so just educating people to think in terms of there's three pathways by which rainfall reaches streams. And those pathways are actually infrastructure assets. What are the three pathways? Well, that which that water which flows over the land, but more importantly, that which flows horizontally just below the land to the surface. That's called interflow. And of course the third component, that which is deep vertical to groundwater. Those pathways are the infrastructure assets. They provide water balance services. So integrated system, pathways are at infrastructure assets. The pathways are providing services. So everyone learns about the water cycle in elementary school. You all learn about it. And everyone seems to forget about it by high school. And I think my own four kids they're gonna judge that that you know grade five, grade eight loss of memory. And so that's why last last September um, we released a primer called Primer on Application of Ecosystem-Based Understanding in the Georgia Basin. And it's written to help multiple audiences, whether elected, technical, or stewardship, because the language must be common to everybody. And anybody in this room must be able to pick up the document and be able to ask the right questions. That's the key, asking the right questions and ensuring that the science-based understanding is applied properly and effectively, because if we're gonna turn things around, We've got to apply, we have the understanding, but we're in the details now of getting the practices right. And those practices are going to restore hydrologic integrity of watershed. So again, it's a long-term commitment, but it starts now. So we're going to go through some guiding principles for watersheds. So watershed protection starts with understanding how water gets to a stream and how long it takes. So again, looking at the three flow paths, surface, interflow, and deep groundwater, the difference is the time element. Right? So surface, from minutes to hours, interflow, from days to seasons, deep groundwater, from years to decades. So when you start short-circuiting the system, and, and, and that water balance is being altered in terms of it coming off quickly, you get the consequences of what we've seen in recent decades. And so that means the guiding principle number one, which is maintain the proportion of rainwater entering the stream by each pathway. Water balance for a typical watershed, I'm assuming you can't necessarily see the, see the numbers, but guiding principle number two is you've got to understand where the water goes naturally and you produce those conditions when you're redeveloping. So that leads to guiding principle number but regular guiding principle number three. What this table is showing you is on an annual basis where the water goes. So if you're just looking at Environment Canada, rainfall and Environment Canada stream flow, what it tells you is that 80% of what falls on the land you see is stream flow and the three pathways. What's really significant on the west coast here is that 55% is the roughly the expected number that will be in interflow. 55% of, of the total uh, flow of uh, total water is water volume in a year. The significance of how that interflow is that what have we historically developed, done when we have developed land? We strip the topsoil, don't we? We strip it down to the glacial heart pan, to, to the bedrock, and we put back turf and then pour the water off. Right? So, that's the significance of the amount of, of the proportion of total rainfall which you just short circuited, and that's what's creating the, you know, the flash flooding. So that's what leads to the guidance number three, which is when you're redeveloping, restore the unit flow to maintain hydrologic integrity. Things like a watershed, you need to understand how a watershed, you know, it streams, the groundwater aquifer sites, and people function as a whole system. So use use and develop land in a way that mimics the natural flow duration. Keep those two words in mind, flow duration. That's what you see, the pattern. Because if you mimic the natural flow duration, reduce risk and improve watershed health, comply with regulatory compliance requirements. That's that's where we're heading. I did include a couple of engineering type slides just to prove I was one. 
So the desired outcome is to prevent extreme erosion, pre prevent flooding, and improve water quality. They have value principle number four, rapidly flow duration. What this is showing, the flow duration is simply saying this graphic represents 25 years of data. How many of like a particular flow rate of five degrees per second? It's just saying that over the last 25 years, there's been 100 hours where that flow rate was exceeded. So uh, the top line, the bottom line rather, the blue line represents natural, that's what's happening in development. But guess what? If we redevelop with mandate mitigation, we'll all do development, redevelopment, you can match the natural condition. And if you're mimicking the flow duration, you can actually prevent flooding because again, this, the top line being red continuation of the old business as usual, but if you start changing your line of practices, mimicking flow duration, you knock the flows down. So you get a double benefit by one strategy has two benefits in terms of reducing flood frequency and restoring the natural flow pattern. That's the objective. So a journey to a water resilient future, and I am running out of time, right? Uh, starting with the first green card, we've got to bring it down to a level where the designers can grasp them. So the group reduces the detail of, of a rain garden. There's three parameters. There's the volume you store in your rain garden. There's the release rate. And then there's the area you need to infiltrate the ground. You give the designers three numbers they can work with. Managing by the numbers, for the past decade in DC, thought leaders have encouraged practitioners to think like a system rather than like an accountant. And I don't know if you can quite see his picture, it's Andy Cordell, who's the acting CFO for North Bend District. He's also the co-chair of Asset Management DC. So he's one of the passionate guys in this province to advance sustainable service delivery, which is focused on the outcomes, not prescriptive methodologies, and get it right in terms of what services are important, what's the desired level of service, and how those services be delivered sustainably. And uh, The other coach here, David Allen, who's the CEO of Courtney, has a great quote, which is the goal of both government is to deliver services. So achieving sustainable service delivery is the end goal of asset management. This happens to be the branding graphic for the sustainable service delivery uh, initiative. All I want to bring to your attention right now is that you know, is the, is the, it's a step-by-step -step process. Local governments are on a continuum because so many local governments in British Columbia weren't even managing their assets. And so what we're trying to do is get them to what we call step three. After they get core assets under control, then they'll be ready to talk about watershed. Watershed, but they don't wait two, three years. You've got to start now. That's the other message. You've got to start now thinking about how are you going to do business differently. So two or three years from now, we'll be able to do it. Right, I'm going to skip ahead because I. Is it time to end? A few minutes. Okay. The real, these last couple of slides that I want to introduce to you, because I want to emphasize we have to get it right. We know, we know what we need to do. We've kind of we've bridged a major, major education gap over the last 15 years in terms of establishing what the science is telling us and how to implement the change. Uh, time is of the essence because of global hydrologic instability. We don't really have time to uh, uh, continue on with standards and practice that got us into the problem in the first place. So what we're facing right now in terms of re the public re-education process with, with, with practitioners in the local government setting is the, the widespread lack of understanding of a fundamental re relationship between flow duration and stream health. They just don't know. And, and, and until, they, until, the, until the light bulbs go on, um, a lot of practices in a lot of places won't be changing. Now, fortunately, in North End District, you do have some people who, who, who understand that still the practices aren't changing fast enough. And then the, the second goal was the continued widespread application of standards and practice that actually led to the, the great industry. So that's what we're trying to deal with in terms of, of turning things around. I'm going to close off a couple of slides. Uh, Andy Reese is a uh, uh, an American uh, water source engineer, uh, he's an author, and you know, like a lot of the Americans, he's a humorist, and he's the one who, over a decade ago, coined the term uh, voodoo hydrology. And really what he was trying to say is that, you know, this, the thing with my fellow engineers, it's, 
you know, you can almost get whatever drug you want if you use these, these standard packs, which are empirical, don't relate to what we're seeing right now. And his concern has been that with the rise of green infrastructure and resilience planning, that's opening the door for a whole new, newer food like you heard beforehand, he says. I'm going to skip this quote because the read all this is saying is that, um, well, I'll go back because the, the risks with the changing climate, the risks are high and the margins of error are too small to view water and watersheds with only in narrow lenses. That, that's the advantage here. And this actually, this quote is from a local government manager in the Metro Vancouver region expressing his consternation at what he's seeing. And he said, well, uh, I seem to get a lot of blank looks when I talk about continuous simulations and flow duration curves to assess impacts on streams. Is it my imagination or has the industry regressed back into deep flow analysis to evaluate impacts? So there's a real concern in terms of education disconnect with Dell, and that's what we're trying to address. So my last slide is Cathedral Thinking, because it describes the vision of what we're trying to achieve. So when you think of, when I say the words Cathedral Thinking, I trust you think of the cathedral. You're also kind of wondering what the relevance of the cathedral. Well, think about the fact that when our ancestors were building cathedrals a thousand years ago, how long did those cathedrals take? <laughs> 100 years, 200 years? So they were, we were talking 48 generations. So the generations that got the idea going, they knew they would not see the end. Right? So all along, there were people who were committing to a, uh, a vision they did have a well thought out blueprint, and I do believe we have blueprints for crash right now, but they had that shared commitment to long term implementation. And it's kind of such a contrast to be talking about you know, a multi generation commitment at, at an era when we're talking about seven or eight second sound bite and then what happened you know, last week, people don't care about anymore. But that's the real thought that I want to leave you with is that you're part of this intergenerational commitment to keep this thing moving, because we may not, this room, may not see the, the outcome of what we're trying to set in motion, but unless people in this room get in motion, it won't happen.